So, welcome back again. Um, our next speaker is Michael Segander. Um, he's a core team member, Postgres committer, Postgres major contributor, everything about, he knows most of the things about Postgres. And now he's going to talk about Postgres 11 features. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Now we're on, yes, technology. <clears throat> I'm gonna say good morning even though it's you know, noon because we consider it morning. Uh, and I just wanna make one more note uh, for the record and for Devrin before I get started, which is no. Yes. And then we're good to go. <clears throat> uh, so we're, I'm here today to talk about Postgres 11. Um, who's already using Postgres 11? It's good, who's already using Postgres 12? You guys are boring. <laughs> uh, so as Devon said, my name is Magnus Hagender. I work for a company called Red Bull Impro. We're an open source services and consultancy business in the Scandinavian area. I'm out of our Stockholm office uh, <clears throat> where I work, well, primarily with databases and unsurprisingly, that means Postgres in our case. That's kind of why I'm here. Uh, within the Postgres project, uh, I'm one of the core team members. Uh, I'm one of the committers on the database backend uh, and I do a lot of work for Postgres Europe, uh, which is the nonprofit that coordinates a lot of these activities across Europe. For one thing, our dev room here today uh, and the PG day that we had on Friday, uh, more downtown. <coughs> uh, but let's talk about Postgres 11. Uh, and let's talk about the new things in Postgres 11. Uh, some of you have uh, seen these things before. Uh, I do this sort of the new version of Postgres talk every now and then. The format's the same, luckily the content is different. There are actually new things in Postgres 11. Uh, <clears throat> and as with all Postgres releases, uh, we go for approximately one release per year, um, targeted at release in September. Uh, what happens then is the Postgres 11 actually started in August of 2017, uh, when we branched off Postgres version 10. At that point, we opened up the development of our master branch for what would become Postgres 11. Uh, now in Postgres, everybody has you know, their own names uh, for everything. We work with something that we call commit fests, which is basically our way of doing iterative development, where we do, the idea is, I should say, because we all know how well plans work, uh, but the idea is to do one month worth of building features, and then one month worth of reviewing and then committing these features, that's the commit fest, and then we just do rinse repeat that for four times, which you know, if you do the math, that's eight months, not 12. But then it takes a while to stabilize it and get it out to be an actual release. <clears throat> so we started in August of 2017 uh, and we finished in almost September 2018. It, some people says it was October, but you know, we can pretend that it was almost September. We're only less than a month late is not all that bad. So the release has been out since uh, October of 2018. Which is why, I guess, I'm actually surprised that so many people put their hand up for that you're already running Postgres 11. That's great news. Well, I hope it's great news. I hope, you know, it actually works for you. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that's actually unusually fast. Uh, about this far into release, I would normally see fewer people who are actually on this version and more people on the previous version. Anyway, let's get into the features that we want to talk about here. I've tried to separate them up a little bit into four sections. <coughs> We've got DBA and administration, uh, SQL and developer, uh, backup and replication, and then just sort of performance, because everybody loves performance. Um, and there's always you know, new, interesting performance things coming out. Uh, so let's start in the area of DBA and administration. First, what, what's the actual difference between you know, DBA and developer today? Well, DBAs do development, and developers do whatever, and DBAing. I just decided to split saying, well, if it's used through SQL, then it's developer. And if it's you know, config file and command line, then it's at DBA. Uh, <clears throat> so let's start with a small feature, uh, or potentially big, depending on whether you need it. Uh, those of you who worked with Postgres for a while have probably run into the fact that our transaction log, or our WAL, uh, is made up of 16 megabyte files. And they're always 16 megabytes. And if you happen to generate a large amount of transactions when you do your log archiving for backups, 
it you know sends the files off one by one and if you generate many of these files every second you know generate a few hundred megabytes in a second that's a lot of overhead in just transmitting the files uh, you've actually been able to I think from the day that transaction log was added to Postgres changed the size of these files you just had to recompile from source and get an incompatible data directory format which you probably didn't want. Uh, 11 will let you configure this while segment size uh, by say, giving a parameter when you initialize the database. You still won't be able to change it once you've initialized your cluster uh, but at initial point you can set it. I would expect the normal use case for this is if you have a very high transaction rate system that generates lots of transaction log, you want this to be a higher number. You can also set it to be a lower number if you are really resource constrained and things like 32 megabytes of disk space is way too much. Uh, but most cases today when we're dealing with database servers like 30 megabytes, it's really not that much. <clears throat> but there could be a use case for it. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is something that can potentially break your things. Potentially. Uh, Who is using the plugin PG stat statements today? Okay, the rest of you should really look into the plugin PG stat statements. It's awesome. It gives you a lot of insight into what your system is actually doing in a very useful format. The PG stat statement tracks your uh, most, used, most frequently used SQL queries in the system across time. And it hashes them and gives you something called a query ID, which uniquely identifies this query. Uh, Prior to version 11, this query ID was 32 bits. In 11, it's 64 bits. Normally, you don't really have to care, but particularly if you have a system that, for example, snapshots the data from this into, into a monitoring to generate you know, cross-time graphs or something, you need to update that system as well to support the 64-bit version. It really is that simple, uh, but there are systems out there that break. It also means if you're using one of the more common uh, tools around this, there are, there are you know, web, web visualization tools uh, for PG stat statements, you just need to upgrade them. As far as I know, they've all released updated versions that support it, uh, but you need to actually install that version. Otherwise, it doesn't help. <coughs> um, we've added the ability to collect statistics on expression indexes. Uh, if you've been tweaking Postgres query tuning, you know about the command uh, alter table set statistics because you get a bad query plan, you tell Postgres we'll look at a bigger part of the data to build more detailed statistics to generate better query plans. And previously you could only do that at the column level. So you could say this column, we need to collect more data about this column to get better query plans. Making planning more expensive, trade off for better query plans. Right? Uh, the new thing in 11 is that you're now able to do this for expressional indexes. An expressional index is you create an index on, well, something that's an expression, so it's not actually a column. Uh, in this example here, uh, I've, created an <coughs> I've uh, created an index on x and then, you know, x, y, and z plus t. The last thing there is not a column. It's a, an expression. It could be a function call to do all sorts of different things. And previously, there was no way to tell Postgres to look more at that. Uh, the syntax for doing this is alter index, and then alter column, and you actually give it the column ordinal in the index, so the third column in the index. Because columns and indexes don't have names. They just don't have names. When you do it on a table, you'd say alter index blah, alter column, my column. But since it doesn't have a name, you have to give it the number. Uh, other than that, the statistics works the same. The default value is normally 100. You increase it, collect more data, analyze takes longer, query planning takes longer. Hopefully, you get a better query plan. Uh, the other big thing that we've done to indexes <coughs> is we now have something called include indexes. Uh, people used to other databases will also know the term covering index, for example. Uh, the idea here is that we can add columns to our index, making them less efficient. And of course, everybody wants less efficient indexes, right? Uh, the idea is we do this in order to be able to use an index-only scan. Uh, if you look at something like uh, the example here, I have a unique index on my table. If I have a unique index, like my primary key, then obviously that index can be used to look up things in this column that's unique. Uh, 
If I want to be able to look up one more column by using an index only scan, I can add this column to the index. But this becomes a problem because now the index is no longer unique on my, what I thought was my primary key. Right? It is now unique across both of the columns. And the difference with include indexes is when I say something like this, I say you know, create unique index using Btree on ID means it's going to be a regular unique index on ID. And then I say include second field. It's going to add second field to the index for every row, but not to the key. So it's still unique only across ID. But any query referencing the ID and second field columns and no other columns can now be satisfied by an index only scan and you never have to look at the actual table. But for as a regular index, this index just became less efficient because there's more data in it, less data fits in cache. Uh, so it's a useful trade-off, but it's something to consider that the actual index does become less efficient. Uh, but the idea is trigger the index only scans. Um, anyone using the PG pre-warm extension? Oh, a couple of people, not too many. Uh, it comes in Postgres Contrib. PG pre-warm has been around for a while. Uh, the idea behind PG pre-warm is, for example, if you need to restart your server, you can run PG pre-warm. It'll snapshot the information about what's in your cache. Because normally when you restart, your cache goes away. <clears throat> so you can tell pre-warm, snapshot it, restart, and then load it back. And the thing that we can do now in Postgres 11 by setting this to automatic is we can have it just snapshot every five minutes. And if it crashes or you, know, you get a replication failover or something like this, it will automatically load the cache as it looked up to five minutes ago, which is normally good enough. Now what it does actually store, it doesn't dump your entire cache. So if you have you know, 50 gigs of cache, it doesn't write 50 gigs of data. It just writes a list of which disk blocks were in the cache. Not the contents of them, just a list of them. Uh, so in particular in cases like you know, recovering from replication failover and things like that, uh, this can be a good way of, of saving this terrible performance blip you usually get when no data is in the cache anymore. Uh, <clears throat> we've added a bunch of new default roles. This is uh, part of the steps towards getting rid of superuser. Well, not really getting rid of superuser, but getting rid of the need to use superuser. Uh, so we have three new roles, PG read server files, write server files, and execute server programs. They kind of tell you what they do, right? If you grant PG read server files to a user, they can read any file on the server, as long as the Postgres OS user has permissions on it. And if you grant PG execute server program, well, they can execute programs on your database server, which may not be the greatest idea. But it depends on who you're granting it to. And it's still better than super user, because super user can do all these things and more. So it's making these things more granular and making it possible uh, to make a more secure installation. Uh, I think one of the most requested features in Postgres over many, many years, alter table add column. Who's ever accidentally done that in production and added the column with a not null and default and then looked at the downtime counter as the entire table was rewritten? Well, you can now actually add a column, not null, with a default and it's more or less instant. It does no longer need to rewrite the table. Now, it does have to be a non-volatile function. You can't set things like current timestamp because that would change over time. That would be very strange. But you can give it an actual default value. And what happens is that Postgres remembers this. And then as the table gets rewritten, either by you, know, you updating something else in the row, creates a new copy of the row, then it'll materialize the default value into that row. So eventually, it'll be like slow updating across the table, and eventually it will be just like it was before, but it does all of this without holding an exclusive lock and rewriting half your database and causing downtime and evil things. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, uh, I'm sure everybody has made that mistake at some point. If you haven't, well, you will. <laughs> and luckily, it will make much less effect now, as long as you set it up right. So let's take a look at some of the SQL side of things. Who's using Postgres full text search? Okay. Uh, been enhanced further. In particular, it doesn't actually enhance the, the search itself. But there, we've previously had 2TS query, which takes a Postgres specific syntax, plain 2TS query, which takes a plain text, 
phrase to TS query, which takes a phrase and turns these into the internal query syntax. Now we have web search to TS query, which takes what you expect and turns it into a search thing. Um, basically, it takes you know the syntaxes that we are used to using in search engines. So you can type you know foo and bar. You can use parentheses to group things. You can do not. You can do all these things in like free text mode. And it will parse those and turn it into a reasonable search query and then run that. Uh, so I would say almost in any case, if you're taking user input and doing a search based on it, which is not exactly an uncommon way of using full text search, you probably want to be using the web search to TS query. And it'll, it, it's a drop-in replacement. Of course, the syntax changes a bit for the user. But functionality, it's just pass in the search term, run the search. It's kind of what you want. Uh, in almost every case. The previous ones are, of course, there if you need the more control and if you need to be uh, more specific about what you're doing. Uh, Postgres domains have been enhanced to basically do things that they couldn't do before. They were like little corner cases. You can now create an array of a domain. And you, could order, and you can create a domain over a composite type. So you can do a domain over an array, over a row, over an array, over a domain. Yeah, well, OK, don't do that. <clears throat> but basically, it's been one of those, oh, there is a little one box that wasn't checked of things you could do with domains. Uh, and now you can do those things, which is always good. Uh, on the SQL side, the really biggest thing, I think, is uh, full support for SQL 2011 window frame clauses, all of them. Uh, our resident uh, SQL standard expert uh, has been telling me that we are actually at this point the only database that does that. Uh, or at least we were about half a year when I last saw him give that presentation. Uh, I don't know enough, but we do add a lot of them. In particular, the new added feature is the range between. Previously, we could only do rows between on the window class. Uh, so it now handles values and not just row counts. And the fact that we have exclusion clauses, so we can exclude current rows, we can exclude ties, and things like that. Of course, everybody knows exactly what that means, right? OK, let's try an example. Uh, if you look at the first one, this is the classic, the way we used to do it, or well, which we, of course, still do. We do a select i, in this case, is a silly table with 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, et cetera, right? We said i, and then we say sum i over order by rows between two preceding and two following. That's what we've been able to do before. Right? For each row, we declare a window that's the two rows prior to this row, this row, and the two rows following it. And then we do a sum over those. And we get a, a you know, running average or running sum across our data. So that's our column that gives us you know, 9, 16, 25, et cetera. Uh, the different thing that we can do now is we can also say sum i over order by i range between two preceding and two following. So instead of looking at two rows, it will look at two values. So if we look, and for any row here, if we look at, for example, the row 5, well, the 25 here is 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9. The 15 comes from, well, it starts with the current row and goes backwards. It was like, oh, this one is 2 or less. OK, include. This one is not, so stop. And then the other way, that, so in this case, it's 3, 5, 7. Now, of course, if my data is this uniform, it's actually every second value. I could just say rows one before and one after. That would be smarter. Uh, <clears throat> but this lets you look at arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary data through that. Uh, and the exclusion thing that we can add is we can just say, well, also, when you do this, just exclude the current row. Then you get the two before and the two after, but not the current one. Uh, and you can say exclude ties, which means you skip rows if they have the same value as the previous one. Things like that. So you can do that. One of the more interesting things around this, uh, I think this is a more uh, interesting example through it, is you can use any data type in Postgres that's sortable, basically, that has uh, the B3 operators as required. Uh, so in this case, we're saying you know, select T, and then we're counting over order by T, range between 15 minutes preceding and 15 minutes following. So presumably T is a timestamp. Right? So we're saying take create a window of 15 minutes before us and after us and just run it across our entire data set and return the count. We can return any aggregates. We can return sums or averages or, or sort of anything like that. And we get data back like this. For every row, you can say, well, at this time stamp at you know, 0013, going 15 minutes back and forth, there were 12 rows in our data. 
And it's with use cases like this that this feature starts to really pay off and you can do really interesting analytics that previously required you to either write a stored procedure or copy all your data up into the application and just loop over it. And obviously this is going to be faster than either one of those ideas because none of those is sort of ever going to be. So basically you have the count and the over. You always have to have an order by, otherwise it would be like, yes, please take me random data and give me a sum. Um, we don't, that doesn't really help. You create the range, 15 minutes preceding, 15 minutes following, creates the window, and then it just runs the window across the data. The other big thing at the SQL level is stored procedures. And some of you have been around for a while, it's like, hey, didn't people used to say that the reason we should use Postgres instead of MySQL is that Postgres had stored procedures and MySQL didn't? Like back in the days when they didn't. I was like, yeah, people kind of said that, but Postgres never actually had stored procedures. Postgres had stored functions. Very similar, um, slightly different. You know, the important thing, it uses the SQL standard syntax, so you can now say call instead of select. It's really important, right? It's the main thing. Now, the really interesting difference between stored procedures and stored functions is that stored functions runs inside of your transactions. Stored procedures can control your transaction. You can't do rollback or commit inside a stored function. You can do rollback and commit inside a stored procedure. Uh, the syntax and how you create it is very similar to how you create a function, except instead of saying create function, you say create procedure. And you don't have a return value the same way. Like you don't return a result set in the same way. So if you look at this, we say, well, we say begin, we say insert values one, commit that, insert value two, roll back that. Right? If you tried this in a stored function, you would just get a syntax error saying, sorry, you can't do this inside of a stored function. Now, what you'd expect if you write this, right? if you read that, you go like, well, if I call this uh, stored procedure, the table should end up with just the one. Right? And the two would then be rolled back and gone. If you do it, well, that's actually exactly what happens. So it does work the way you would expect it. It gives you the ability uh, to do full transaction control. In stored functions, you could use save points. But you can't control the outside transaction that sort of runs everything. Uh, so that's also like a big thing. In particular, I've noticed, uh, I do a lot of work with people who migrate from you know, the big expensive proprietary databases into Postgres. And there are a lot of patterns there, and a lot of, in particular, things like loading jobs and ETL jobs kind of things that really use this heavily. You've usually been able to accomplish the same thing in Postgres previously, but this makes it a lot easier, both from the migration and the actual uh, implementation side of things. So let's take a look at backup and replication. You all do backups, right? No, you don't. <laughs> I mean, come on, really. <clears throat> uh, there have been a couple of, there's been no super major things, but a number of incremental improvements. Um, Postgres adds something called the ability to advance replication slots. Uh, primarily, this is not something that you will use directly. It is something that your replication management tools uh, will be using. You know, tools like Patroni or Rep Manager or all of these things around Postgres. Uh, the idea is, we have these replication slots that keep track of where different nodes are in the replication stream. But if you have, say, you have a, a primary and a standby, and then you do logical replication to a different machine, and then you get a failover between your primary and the standby, it will actually lose track of the logical replication step by default, because the replication slots are gone. And what you could do previously is, well, then I create the replication slot on the standby as well, and, and the logical replica will work just fine except now your standby will instead run out of disk space because you have a replication slot that blocks disk reuse. And there's previously been no way to move this replication slot without actually replicating the data. So there were you know, workarounds where let's create a replica that pipes all this data to DevNull, which is not really productive. The idea here is very simple. You can now at regular intervals just move all your replication slots across a cluster of many machines to be in sync. They never have to be exactly in sync, but they're you know, close enough in sync within a couple of megabytes so that you don't run out of disk space. Uh, so this makes the kind of like mixed clusters of, of mixing physical and logical replication uh, a lot more manageable. Uh, speaking of logical replication, who's using logical replication in Postgres 10 or 11 today? That is surprisingly few. That was one of our headline features. <laughs> 
Come on, guys, you should be using it since 10. It took a lot of work to build that. Uh, one of the things that we couldn't do in Postgres version 10 is logical replication did not replicate truncate. It would replicate your insert updates and deletes, but if you actually did truncate on the primary, the table would go empty on the primary, but it would keep the data on the standby because the truncate wasn't replicated, which is usually not what you wanted. Uh, in 11, it does. Uh, you can turn this on and off on an individual publication. You can say, for this table, I want truncates to replicate. For this, I don't want them to replicate. Logical replication has a lot of like, non-standard use cases where that actually makes perfect sense. But since in most cases it doesn't make sense, it will be on by default. So if you just create a publication or if you upgrade your Postgres version 10, your logical replication will just start replicating truncate. It will just start working. And if you don't want that, you have to explicitly go turn it off with alter publication. Um, another more on the physical replication side, and in particular on the backup side, uh, base backups taken through the Postgres internal protocol no longer include unlogged tables, uh, which makes a lot of sense. The unlogged tables are tables that don't go into the transaction log. So by definition, they're not crash safe but they're useful for things like large data loading job. You might load the data into an on-log table and then do some processing and merge it into a regular table, for example. Um, and unlog tables work the way that when Postgres crashes or restarts, it just wipes the contents of the unlog table. It comes up as an empty table because it, it's not crash safe. We, don't, we can't trust the data, so we delete the data. The table is there, but it's empty. And what we did for backups was we included this table in the backups then we restored this table on your restore. And then as you started Postgres, we deleted it again. And particularly given that these are often used for like large loading tables, that's kind of a waste of space in your backups. If the only thing that we guarantee is we're going to delete them as soon as we start up. Uh, so we no longer do that. <clears throat> and similar thing for uh, temp tables, which are even more apparent, right? Temp tables, when you do create temporary table, well, if you disconnect, the table gets deleted. That's how it's supposed to work, right? So by definition, if Postgres restarts, it gets deleted. If you restore from a backup, it gets deleted. But it used to be included in the actual backup and get deleted on the restore instead. So yeah, it's, it, it, I've seen cases where this saves a lot of disk space in the backups uh, that were just completely useless. Uh, the other thing that backups do now is that they will validate page level checksums as the backup runs. If you've enabled page level checksums on Postgres, unfortunately this is something that is not enabled by default and you can only enable it currently um, on start, uh, sorry, on initialization of your database cluster. So when you run initDB, you have to decide to use them. You can't turn them on after the fact. Uh, you probably should turn them on in almost every single case because you want to know if your data is corrupt. Now, the way that this worked previously is whenever Postgres reads a disk page, so you run a select query or something, it reads a page from disk, it validates the checksum. But if you have tables that are very infrequently read, or portions of tables that are very infrequently read, you can get bit rot in those files, and you would never know, because Postgres didn't validate the checksum. Now, when we run backups, we read all your data. Right? That's kind of, you have to do that. And the expensive part of validating the checksums is reading the data. Actually calculating a checksum across you know, an 8K block is very, very cheap today. Um, so what we're doing now is just whenever we read the data for backups, as soon as we read the block, we validate the checksum of it. And this way, because backups will include your infrequently used uh, portions of the database. So it will then notice that your data is corrupt. Now, it can't fix it for you, unfortunately. But it can tell you, hey, you have corrupt data in you know, this table. The idea being, well, hopefully you still have your previous backup. And you can go restore from your previous backup and use your log archive to basically roll past the corruption and just remove the corruption. But if you only get to know it you know, six months later when somebody queried the infrequently queried table, you may not have a six-month-old backup and you may not want to restore a six-month-old backup. Right? So it's all about getting the information sooner. Uh, so that you can properly handle it while it doesn't cost you so much to handle it. But again, checksums are not enabled by default, but I do strongly encourage you uh -huh. to consider enabling them. 
We are looking at, uh, in the upcoming version of Postgres, there will most likely, it's not been committed yet, but most likely there will be toolage available to enable and disable checksums. Unfortunately, enabling checksums on a large database is very expensive because it basically has to rewrite the whole database. But disabling checksums will be very cheap. And there are actually tools you can get, uh, they're just not part of Postgres today, that will safely turn off checksums on a running cluster. Right? You just have to stop Postgres, run a tool that runs in less than a second and start it again to turn it off. Which I find a good reason for, well, just turn them on by default because it's easy to turn them off. It is not easy to turn them back on. They do create a bit of overhead. Um, in my experience, nowhere near enough overhead to be a problem versus the problem of realizing too late that you have disk corruption. Uh, and if you trust your hard drives or your SAN or your, your cloud provider not to generate disk corruption, then good luck with that. Far too many people do, and it can be very expensive. Okay, let's talk about a few things around performance, right? Everybody wants things to run faster. Almost everybody wants things to run faster. Um, Postgres 9.6 added parallelism. So the ability to run parallel query, use multiple CPUs for the same query, right? Up until 9.6, you could only, you had the matching of you know, one connection, one CPU, which becomes a problem with modern machines with hundreds of CPU cores. And you go like, yes, you can use one. Sometimes we could use two, one for a background job and one for your query. Um, as of 9.6, we could use multiple ones, but in practice, it didn't really help that much because the limit, it limited the number of queries, like the number of types of joins, the number of types of scans. For example, in 9.6, you couldn't parallelize a query if it involved an index scan. Postgres 10 made it really, really useful because it removed most of these restrictions. Uh, I can actually say, I think I'm still at a point that none of, of our consulting customers have actually had any use for parallelism in 9.6. And probably 80% of them have had use for parallelism in 10. So it's really, that's when it became useful. Uh, now 11 adds a few more things that makes it even better. Uh, there are a bunch of general enhancements that just sort of, you know, silently makes it better and you don't have to care. Uh, we've added something called the parallel append plan nodes. Doesn't really help you know that, it just runs faster. Uh, and we have something called parallel aware hash joins. Whereas previously, if you were running a hash join, it supported parallelism, but it did basically, if you parallelized it across four processes, in, in a simplified version, you can say it ran four parallel hash joins, they built their own hash tables, they were completely independent, just on different parts of the table. Um, with the parallel aware hash joins, they all share a hash table, so you can get a much bigger hash table, much more efficiency, by still using it across multiple processes. Uh, and these are all things that you don't have to do anything about. This is just like literally run 11 and your queries will be faster. That's the best kind of enhancements, right? Um, we now have the ability to do parallel create index. Because, well, create index is a DDL command that usually takes a long time if you have a lot of data. Uh, and it's very often CPU bound. Unlike many other DDL commands, which are blocked by the amount of I.O. you can do, create index in its simplest form, well, it loads your whole table, it sorts it, and then it writes it out as an index, right? Obviously, if it's a large table, it's not quite that simple, but the basic principle is that. And sorting takes time. Sorting is expensive. So we can parallelize that. Um, we have a new parameter called max parallel maintenance workers. Say that fast four times. Um, the default value is two, which means that your create index will use two CPUs to run. Uh, there are definite cases, particularly if you're like loading from a dump or, or you know, big load jobs where you don't really care about the effect of the rest of the system, where you will want to increase this quite a lot, like eight, you know, scale out across eight CPUs, for example. Problem is, of course, if you run your create index across eight CPUs, you probably kill everybody else on the system. Right? So you might not want to change that globally for everything but it's something that is worth considering. Now, unfortunately, parallel create index only works for B tree indexes. Uh, the most expensive index I think we normally create today in Postgres is, for example, PostGIS geographical indexes. They can't be parallelized. Well, yet, but they can't be parallelized in 11. Hopefully we'll get that sorted, but it's not there yet. Uh, so parallel query uh, was the big headline feature of Postgres 9.6, right? And it made really useful in 10. Uh, the big headline feature in Postgres 10 was partitioning. 
And in my view, sort of just like uh, parallel query was not really that useful in 9.6, partitioning is not really that useful in 10, but it builds a lot of important infrastructure. And 11 for partitioning is like 10 for parallelism, it starts delivering, like now is when you get all the benefits. There were a lot of things, uh, declarative partitioning with the syntax and basic functionality was in 10. So if you were using the previous sort of manual partitioning and you're on 10, it's definitely worth migrating to this one, but it fundamentally works exactly the same as before, just with prettier syntax. But it has all the same drawbacks, almost. It fixed like one thing. Now 11 fixes a bunch of things. Uh, number one, it adds support for default partitions. Uh, in Postgres 10, if you added partitions and you try to insert a row that didn't match anything, you would just get an error. In 11, you can add a partition like this, you know, partition of P default, and every row that doesn't match anything else will go here. Uh, one of the absolute biggest thing is if you did, in previous versions, if you didn't update on a row so that the partitioning key changed so that it would end up in a different partition, it would just fail. You couldn't do that. Once you'd put a row into a partition, it would have to stay in that partition. In 11, you can just update it. It'll get moved to the other partition. It'll just work. Uh, what you had to do previously was basically manually delete it and then reinsert it, and then it would work. But that comes with other, like, it's a lot more work. It's tricky. And the whole point of, of partitioning is that it's supposed to be transparent. Right? It's supposed to look like one table to your application while actually being 100 tables underneath. And, and having to not do update is not really transparent. Uh, it's still not perfectly transparent, but it's much closer. <clears throat> now, you can still get some concurrency issues because in practice what it does is a delete and then an insert. Uh, but they're not as bad as they were before. But there could, in theory, you could do the delete and then somebody else does the same thing at the same time and things like that. Uh, another limitation and, and advantage is that you had no way to actually, once you'd partitioned your table, you couldn't create indexes across the whole thing. You're in, you would have to create indexes individually in each partition. Uh, 11 adds what we call local partitioned indexes, which is you can create an index on your master table, which will then automatically get created across all of your partitions. And most importantly, if you create a new partition, it will also get the index. So it keeps going. Now you can still add individual partition indexes as well, because maybe you know, if you have time-based data, your old partitions can, offer, uh, can afford to have a few more indexes because they're mostly read-only. So you can still have them, but you can create these indexes that will spread out to all of them, including future ones. And you can actually now create a cross-partition unique constraint uh, as long as the uh, all partition keys are part of the constraint. Because then Postgres can know that this is actually unique across all of, the, um, all of the partitions by the fact that it is also unique on the individual ones. Now this is the foundation for being able to have a foreign key pointing to a partition table. Unfortunately, we can't do that yet. We're hoping to have that. It's a, a patch that's being reviewed for Postgres version 12 and just a couple of days ago, I think we heard the report saying it's most likely going to be in there, but it's not there yet, so no promises. Um, other things around the partitioning, insert on conflict. Use that, the, the upsert method, insert on conflict, do update, or insert on conflict, do nothing. It didn't work on partitioning. Now it does. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's also one of those. It, it's not transparent if some things don't work. Uh, another really big thing is we have a new and better way of doing partition pruning. Uh, partition pruning is, is when the query planner and executor figures out that, oh, I only need to look at one of your 100 partitions, thus things run faster. That's one of the main reasons we do partitioning, right? Uh, the way that this used to work is that Postgres did this in the planner. So when you submitted your query, it would look at the query, it would look at the parameters to the query, and based on that data, it would figure out which partitions to scan. And there were a lot of cases where that could fail. For example, if you had a query, you know, where x equals, or where x in, and put a subquery there, then the planner has no way of knowing what the subquery is going to return, so it will scan all partitions. And that defeats a lot of point. Uh, the way that 11 does it is it does the old pruning first, so it looks at the query and deletes it, removes all the partitions it can, but then it runs a second run of pruning once it's in the executor, and it can run the subquery, it can get, oh, I got these numbers back, 
and then it runs a second pass and deletes a new bunch of partitions. So there's a lot of, of types of queries that would previously just give you a scan across every partition that will now just scan the partitions that you need. Which again is one of the main reasons that we use partitions, right? It's to be able to scan them and to be able to delete them. Um, we've added uh, hash partitioning. Previously we had list partition and uh, range partition. Now you can say hash partition, which is the idea you pick a column and you say, I want this in four partitions, have the system distribute it evenly between these partitions as good as evenly becomes based on the hash value. But if you have a good hash function, it, it will be pretty good. So in this case, previously you would say, uh, you say partition by hash of i instead of partition by list or range. And then you, cre you still have to create the partitions. So here I say, well, create this partition for values with modulus four, remainder zero. Then you get a modulus four, remainder one, two, and three. These are your four partitions. And you can subpartition it as long as you keep the, the ratios workable. Uh, and get into more of those. Uh, and this is for just sort of, if you just want to distribute your data maybe across multiple storage devices or something like that, you can put your uh, partitions across them. Uh, we've added partition-wise joins, which is basically if you have two partition tables that are partitioned on the same key and you join on that key, then you can actually execute that query as joining partitions individually to each other instead of just doing one partition across all the others, then one partition across all the others. Um, it has to be a join on the complete partition key, but if you do that, the planner can figure out and see that, okay, this is the special case where you can run these as, as many simple operations instead of one more complicated operation. This is turned off by default. So there's a configuration like enable partition wise joins equals false by default. And the reason for that is that it makes planning of your queries on partition tables more expensive. Like there's a cost involved in figuring this out. Uh, but if you have a workload where you know that you're actually doing this, you're joining tables that are partitioned on the same keys, then you should definitely consider turning this on for those particular sessions by you know, just issuing the set enable partition wise join equals on or true or one or you know, whichever one you prefer. Um, so that's one of the few of these that you actually have to turn on. Most of the other things are just there. Um, we've added something called partition-wise aggregates. So again, if you do a group by, and you group by on your partition key, or you know, part of the partition key, uh, sorry, the partition key is part of your group by, then you can actually run the group on the individual partition and bring up the summary values and then run, run it again on those, thereby making the scan much more uh, scalable. Um, for example, I mean, the sum of, of a bunch of rows is the same thing as the sum of the sums. Uh, and then it's based on that as long as you have the partition key. Um, there is some other sort of general performance. Uh, the particularly big thing you'll see here is Postgres now has a JIT compilation of expressions and JIT compilations of what we call tuple deforming and forming, which of course everybody knows exactly what it means, right? Um, it uses LLVM, uh, so it, the availability of this actually depends on your package Postgres. Uh, what's normal uh, is you may need to install an extra package. For example, if you're using the uh, YUM distribution on Red Hat or CentOS, you, there's a separate package that you install on top of your Postgres that just enables this. And what it does is, uh, for example, it, it does uh, expression inlining, which is if you run like date, big data warehousing queries. The way that Postgres works is, is you, know, you run the expressions normally in software and it's not super optimized for the CPU because it can't be because we have all sorts of interesting data types. Uh, and what it'll do is when the cost goes above a certain cost, it will trigger and have LLVM byte compile this particular expression, you know, take this column plus this column divided by this column and turn that into machine code, and then run your query with that, which, you know, if you're processing a few hundred million rows or something, that can be massively much faster. I've seen benchmark of, you know, ridiculous numbers, like 90%. That's obviously a constructed benchmark. There are also cases where it will be slower, right? because it takes longer to do the compilation than it takes to, to run the query itself. The system tries to only enable it when it's 
beneficial, it will not always succeed. You can, there's a tuning parameter that you can tune how high should the cost be before we turn on JET. Uh, but particularly if you are uh, running like data warehousing or something like that, something that processes large amounts of data, this go look at installing those packages. It will definitely make things faster. If what you're doing is simple OLTP, you're never looking at more than two rows at a time, it's probably not going to make a fundamental difference. Uh, it's for the cases where you, where you run a lot of expressions fast. Um, so that's a lot of features, right? That we probably covered, I don't know, 5%? Uh, but hopefully we covered all the big ones. Um, there's always going to be a lot more things, right? There's a lot of smaller fixes. There are a lot of performance improvements that we can't go through. Uh, if there are, so I usually say, if there's any of the Postgres developers in the room and I didn't mention your feature, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's important because all the features are important. They're important to somebody. They're important to somewhere. So please help. We do still need your help. Postgres 11 has been released, but we still need your help out here to you know, download and test it and run it. And some of you are already. That's awesome. Now you need to go test the new features that you maybe didn't know existed. Um, download your packages, run your application, and let us know. We're still very much interested in feedback on things like, in particular, you know, oh, in this workload, you know, JIT made things slower, or you know, the parallelism doesn't actually work, and things like that. Um, we're, we're, we believe we're in pretty good shape on the fact that we still deliver the correct responses, but there can definitely be you know, performance regressions under certain workloads uh, where we may need to tune default values of parameters and things like that. And if we get that feedback in early, it makes it easier. Uh, you don't have a version of Postgres 12 to test on yet, but feedback that you give us on Postgres 11 now is going to make it into Postgres 12, uh, which you're going to see in about six months, most likely. Development ongoing. Uh, we hope to have it ready in, let's call it September. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. We hope to have it ready this year. Uh, we all know, you know, time plans and things. So that's all I wanted to mention. I want to thank you very much for showing up and staying awake on the second day of Falstam. That's pretty impressive. Um, if you have any further questions, I think we have like three minutes or so before we have to get out. And after that, feel free to just grab me outside for any further questions. But anyone? Ah, yes? Is it on? Yeah. I believe you said for the partitioning that there is now a feature where it will run a sub-query first and then replan based on the results? Um, so that is not entirely correct. It will not replan things based on the result. It will rerun the partition pruning. So the only right. part that runs is the whole, oh, I know that I don't need to scan these partitions over here because based on the things that came up, I know all my data is over here. It doesn't actually change the query plan. Oh, that's a shame. I see a lot of cases where that might help, actually. There, th that would def definitely be an interesting addition, sort of generic replanning when you start running a query and realize, oh, this is not good. Uh, but that's not something we have today, no. Sorry. Uh, anyone else? Any questions? We have one in here. How should we take care of indexing when we use uh, window range operations? Uh, do we preferably have an index on the field that is used for the ordering, as I guess, but do we have other things to take care about? Uh, you mean for the, the window uh, query? Yeah, style. that you presented uh, earlier. Yeah. <coughs> it's, it's really the same. What, you, what it's running underneath is you know, a select with an order by. So you, yeah, you need the same kind of indexing considerations as you would if you just did that select with an order by. Okay. So if you, you may also have an outside where clause and then combine it with the order by for, for an index like that. But, but at the bottom, it's the same kind of indexes that you would so have for existing the existing indexes would be used efficiently for yes. this kind of operation. We don't have anything on top to yes. take care of. Uh, exactly. Existing indexes will absolutely be used. Now, of course, if you run it across your entire table, mm -hmm. it's probably not going to use the index. But it didn't do that before either yeah. <laughs> because that becomes too expensive. But, but it's the same considerations as you, you had for sorting that kind of data before. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Darren, run. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for transaction and procedures. Now we can build the ETL process without any third-party system. And uh, I would like to ask about uh, 
a small thing, calculated field. To have calculated field in, table, in tables like in MathSQL, to have uh, uh, indexes in this, uh, in this field and uh, yeah, so we, think? We, like uh, I think the, the standard calls is a generated column, right? Where you, you define that this column is going to be x plus y, right? Uh, we don't have that. Uh, what you can do in Postgres, you can create an index on the expression, right? Uh, and that will be used if you're querying it. And then you can create a view on top so that you, you read it through the view. But there's, you, there's no way to materialize it into the table un, unless you want to write the trigger. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I think it's time to kick everybody out and change to yeah. the next talk. Thank, Thank you. you very much.